my bits, I'm going to show images of pituitary macroadenoma. And as mentioned in the previous video, the only difference between a micro and a macroadenoma is the size. A macroadenoma is typically larger than 10 millimeters. And the mass you see in a macroadenoma is the anterior pituitary itself. The posterior pituitary bright spot is often displaced upwards above the level of the diaphragm. The symptoms of a macroadenoma are not only caused by hormonal disturbances, but also by the extension and compression on surrounding structures. A macroadenoma can extend supracellar with compression of the chiasm. And in most medical books, it says that this leads to a bitemporal hemianopsia. And there was a very nice article in the ATR 2015, where they evaluated the visual fields in 115 patients with macroadenomas, and only one of them had bitemporal hemianopsia. So the visual field defects are not pathognomonic, and there's also involvement of prechiasmatic optic nerves or postchiasmatic optic tracts. The macroadenoma can also extend into the cavernous sinus, and it can extend infracellar in the sphenoid sinus, sometimes with destruction of the clivus. When I look at sagittal images in patients with a cellar and supracellar mass, the first thing I look for is if there is enlargement of the cella. If the cella is enlarged, it's most likely a macroadenoma. If the cella is not enlarged, you can think of other pathologies such as a meningioma. Macroadenomas can be non-hormone producing or null adenomas, or they can be hormone producing. And the most common hormone producing macroadenoma is a prolactinoma. In females, this presents with galactorrhea, and in males, one of the symptoms can be a decreased sex drive. And you can see an example of a prolactinoma in a middle aged male on this T2 weighted and post contrast T1 weighted image. You can see the supracellar extension with displacement of the right side of the optic chiasm and there's involvement of the cavernous sinus with encasement of the carotid arteries on both sides. The evaluation of the involvement of the cavernous sinus is not so easy because the medial wall of the cavernous sinus is really thin and if there's only a little bit of extension, you do not know if the wall has been pushed away or if there's really invasion. These are endoscopic images related to a drawing with the components of the wall, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And this is a very old article from 1986 in the ATR, where you can see the dural lining drawn here and the dotted line is the periosteal dura and the extension of a macroadenoma can be kind of subdural so underneath the dura and the cavernous sinus and the adenoma can also extend from its supracellar portion lateral so spreading above the cavernous sinus and in both cases there is no invasion. There have been different classification systems and the one we use in our hospital is the CNOSP classification and you look at the macroadenoma and its relation to the carotid artery to predict if it's invasion of the cavernous sinus or not and in the lower row there's definitely invasion and on this image, it's a little bit more debatable. To evaluate the cavernous sinus, it's best to do one millimeter images. This is the same patient, a six year old female with three millimeter and one millimeter images. 
at the same level and you can see that on the three millimeter images you would say the extension is less than 180 degrees surrounding the carotid artery whereas on the one millimeter images you would say it's between 180 and 270 degrees in macroadenomas you can also have hemorrhage or hemorrhagic infarction leading to an acute presentation and this is an example of a pregnant 37 year old female known with a microprolactinoma and she presented at the ER with headache and decreased vision in her right eye and you can see on these T1 weighted images a cellar and supracellar mass with a fluid fluid level and displacement of the optic chiasm and it is good to realize that in contrast to an uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the brain in a uh, hemorrhagic uh, macroadenoma you do not always have a hemosiderin rim in the top differential diagnosis of a kistic macroadenoma or a macroadenoma with hemorrhage is a rutgers cleft cyst there is a nice flow chart which comes down to looking for signs of hemorrhage such as fluid fluid levels or septation which are more in favor of an adenoma whereas an intracystic nodule is more in favor of a rutgers cleft cyst and we are going to discuss rutgers cleft cyst in the next frame bit by bit so i do hope you will stay 